Diabetes Canada 2018 Clinical Practice Guidelines, Hyperglycemic Emergencies in Adults. This chapter was co-authored by myself, Dr. Jeanette Gogan, as well as Dr. Jeremy Gilbert. The key change is new information on diabetic ketoacidosis with SGLT2 inhibitor therapy. Hyperglycemic emergencies include DKA or diabetic ketoacidosis, HHS, hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state. Common features are insulin deficiency leading to hyperglycemia, which results in urinary loss of water and electrolytes. This results in volume depletion, electrolyte deficiencies, and hyperosmolarity. As well, insulin deficiency when it's absolute and increased glucagon allows the development of ketoacidosis in DKA. We should suspect DKA or HHS in an ill patient with hyperglycemia. Usually in DKA, you'll find ketoacidosis, ECF volume contraction, milder hyperosmolarity, normal to high glucose. They may have decreased level of consciousness. Beware of hypokalemia. This is uh, critical to treat before using insulin as it can harm the person if you don't. You must use insulin to treat the patient and there's an absolute insulin deficiency and increase of glucagon uh, underlying the pathophysiology of its development. In terms of HHS, there's a minimal acid base problem. In fact, the major problems are ECF volume contraction with hyperosmolarity and marked hyperglycemia. The patient usually has marked decreased level of consciousness. Again, beware hypo of hypokalemia, particularly if you're using insulin to treat this condition. They may need insulin so there's a relative insulin deficiency. You should suspect DKA if the pH is less than 7.3, the bicarbonate is less than 15 millimoles per liter, the anion gap is greater than 12 millimoles per liter. This is, uh, this is calculated by taking the serum sodium and subtracting the serum chloride and bicarbonate from it. There should be positive serum or urine ketones, the plasma glucose should be greater than 14 millimoles per liter, but may be lower in certain conditions, and one should look for the precipitating factor. The clinical uh, presentation of DKA is as follows. The symptoms of hyperglycemia incur include polyuria and polydipsia and weakness. Symptoms of acidosis include air hunger, nausea, vomiting, and abdominal pain and altered sensorium. Signs of hyperglycemia are ECF volume contraction, and signs of acidosis involve cosmos respiration, acetone odored breath, and altered sensorium. Symptoms and signs of the precipitating condition can be anticipated based on the list of conditions on slide 20. It's important to be aware of conditions that may make diagnosis of DKA difficult, such as conditions that increase bicarbonate, for example, vomiting, this will result in mis mixed acid-base disturbance, so pH is not as low as one would normally expect. Pregnancy or the use of SGLT2 inhibitors can result in normal or only mildly elevated glucose, so-called euglycemic DKA. If there's a significant osmotic diuresis, there can be loss of keto anions. This can normalize or near normalize the anion gap. And finally, if the keto anion is predominantly beta-hydroxybutyrate, this results in negative serum ketones because it's not measured in the, the nitroprusside reaction. If you're strongly suspicious of DKA and the serum and urine ketones are negative, you should order serum beta-hydroxybutyrate. This slide highlights an overview of the management of DKA in adults. We will uh, look at each component separately. Fluids, potassium, and acidosis are the pillars of treatment. We've already discussed how to diagnose diabetic ketoacidosis. In terms of monitoring, one would follow plasma electrolytes, bicarbonate, anion gap, glucose, creatinine, plasma osmolality, fluid balance, and level of consciousness every two to four hours depending on severity. The precipitating factors and complications also have to be monitored for. Managing IV fluids are important, serum potassium, and acidosis. Let's look at each of these individually. 
One usually replaces fluids with normal saline until the patient is euvolemic. When, they're, when they have low ECF volume, if they're in severe shock, one uses normal saline one to two liters per hour to correct hypotension and shock. And then one would move to the moderate, the mild to moderate column, use normal saline 500 mils per hour for four hours, then 250 mils per hour for four hours. These are just suggestions. It obviously depends on the size of the patient and their clinical context. Once the patient is euvolemic, can, you should consider the plasma sodium concentration and glucose concentration to determine the ongoing IV fluid type. It's important to understand that plasma osmolality is reported in the units millimoles per kilogram. This should be considered to be equivalent to millimoles per liter. The kilogram has nothing to do with the patient's weight. So moving to the left column, if the corrected plasma sodium concentration is normal or high, and the rate of fall of effective plasma osmolality is less than 3 millimoles per liter per hour, switch to 0.45% NACL, i.e. half normal saline, to replace ongoing losses. Moving to the right column, if the corrected plasma sodium concentration is low or the rate of fall of effective plasma osmolality is greater than 3 millimoles per liter per hour, continue with 0.9% NACL, i.e. normal saline, to replace ongoing losses. Once plasma glucose reaches 14 millimoles per liter, you should add D5W or D10W to IV fluids to maintain plasma glucose of 12 to 14 millimoles per liter. The second pillar is replacing potassium. Don't forget hypokalemia is an avoidable cause of death in DKA. If the serum potassium is less than 3.3 millimoles per liter, you should give 40 millimoles per liter of KCL. This is the maximum concentration allowed peripherally, and no insulin until the potassium is greater than 3.3 millimoles per liter. Ideally, you'd be giving about 40 millimoles per hour. If this concentration is not allowed in your hospital peripherally, you may have to give it through a central line. If the potassium is greater than 3.3 but less than 5 to 5.5 millimoles per liter, you should give 40 to 50 millimoles of, per liter of KCL, again maximum 40 millimoles per liter, and do this less aggressively if they're in renal failure. Remember, correct the potassium first, then start insulin. And now for the third pillar, managing acidosis with insulin. If the patient's potassium is greater than 3.3 millimoles per liter, one should administer IV short-acting insulin at a dose of 0.1 units per kilogram per hour and adjust the rate of insulin infusion based on anion gap resolution. It's critical to avoid hypokalemia and hypoglycemia. If the pH is less than 7, you can consider the use of bicarbonate administration intravenously one ampule per hour until the pH is greater than 7. It's important to avoid hypokalemia as bicarbonate as well as insulin can shift potassium into cells, lowering the plasma potassium level. If the potassium concentration in the plasma is less than 3.3 millimoles per liter, correct hypokalemia before starting insulin. Insulin, intravenous insulin, should be maintained until the anion gap normalizes. Insulin is used to treat acidosis, not hyperglycemia. The next step is to identify and treat precipitating factors. Insulin emission is the most common cause of DKA. DKA can also occur as a new diagnosis of type 1 diabetes or even type 2 diabetes because of infection and sepsis, because of myocardial infarction. A small rise in troponin may occur without overt ischemia. ECG changes may reflect hyperkalemia. Also, th thyrotoxicosis and certain drugs can precipitate DKA. In terms of preventing DKA and HHS, for type 1 diabetes, it's important for the patients to have education around sick day management. It's important for them to know they must continue their insulin even if they're not eating, and, it's and their blood sugars should be frequently monitored when they're ill. They can also monitor for ketones. Type, patients with type 2 diabetes require 
also require education around sick day management and frequent monitoring of their blood sugars when ill. To summarize the priorities that must be addressed in the management of adults presenting with hyperglycemic emergencies, there are the metabolic ones that we've discussed, ECF volume contraction, potassium deficit and abnormal concentration, metabolic acidosis, and hyperosmolality, the water deficit leading to increased corrective sodium concentration plus hyperglycemia. Precipitating causes of uh, DKA in HHS must be sought for, including new diagnosis of diabetes, insulin emission, infections, myocardial infarction, and stroke. Remember, ECG changes may reflect hyperkalemia. A small increase in troponin may occur without overt ischemia, thyrotoxicosis, trauma, and drugs. There are other complications of DKA in HHS must be looked for, including hyper and hypokalemia, ECF volume overexpansion, cerebral edema, particularly important in children, hypoglycemia, pulmonary emboli, aspiration, hypocalcemia if phosphate is used, stroke, acute renal failure, and deep vein thrombosis. The severity of each will dictate the priority of action. So recommendation number one, in adults with DKA or HHS, a protocol should be followed that incorporates the following principles of treatment. Fluid resuscitation, avoidance of hypokalemia, insulin administration, avoidance of rapidly falling serum osmolality, and search for precipitating cause, as illustrated in figure one. Recommendation two, point-of-care capillary beta-hydroxybutyrate may be measured in the hospital or outpatient setting in adults with type 1 diabetes with capillary blood glucose greater than 14 millimoles per liter to screen for DKA, and a beta-hydroxybutyrate level of greater than 1.5 millimoles per liter warrants further testing for DKA. Negative urine ketones should not be used to rule out DKA. Recommendation three, in adults with DKA, Intravenous 0.9% sodium chloride, so-called normal saline, should be administered initially at 500 mls per hour for 4 hours, then 250 mls per hour for 4 hours, with consideration of a higher initial rate, 1 to 2 liters per hour, in the presence of shock. For adults with HHS, intravenous fluid administration should be individualized. Recommendation 4. In adults with DKA, an infusion of short-acting intravenous insulin of 0.1 units per kilo per hour should be used. The inf insulin infusion rate should be maintained until resolution of ketoacidosis as measured by the normalization of plasma anion gap. Once the plasma glucose concentration falls to 14 millimoles per liter, intravenous dextrose should be started to avoid hypoglycemia. Individuals treated with SGLT2 inhibitors with symptoms of DKA should be assessed for this condition, even if the blood glucose is not elevated. Our key messages, diabetic ketoacidosis, DKA, and hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state, HHS, should be suspected in ill persons with diabetes. If either DKA or HHS is diagnosed, precipitating factors must be sought and treated. DKA and HHS are medical emergencies that require treatment and monitoring for multiple metabolic abnormalities and vigilance for complications. A normal or mildly elevated blood glucose does not rule out diabetic ketoacidosis in certain conditions such as pregnancy or with SGLT2 inhibitor use. DKA requires intravenous insulin administration 0.1 units per kilo per hour for resolution Bicarbonate therapy may be considered only for extreme acidosis, such as pH less than 7. Key messages for people with diabetes. If you are sick, your blood glucose levels may fluctuate and be unpredictable. During these times, it is a good idea to check your blood glucose levels more often than usual, for example, every 2 to 4 hours. You should drink plenty of sugar-free fluids or water. If you have type 1 diabetes with blood glucose levels remaining over 14 millimoles per liter before meals, or if you have symptoms of DKA, check for ketones by measuring a urine ketone test or blood ketone test. Blood ketone testing is preferred over urine testing. Develop a sick day plan with your diabetes health care team. This should include information on which diabetes medications you should continue and which ones you should temporarily stop, guidelines for insulin adjustment if you're on insulin, 
and advice on when to contact your health care provider or go to the emergency room. Please visit our guidelines.diabetes.ca for more information or download the app. The Diabetes Canada Clinical Practice Guidelines can be found at these sources. Thank you for your attention.